from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. God sent John the Baptist for people like Mr. and Mrs. Bradford sitting in a Lincoln Continental of nothing but a reminder of death and pain and loss. This John was sent into the world to proclaim a sunrise, a new era, a new beginning, a new work of God to guide our feet, he says, into the way of peace. And it's with that that we enter into our, to John's depiction of John the Baptist's ministry in verse 19, beginning with his mission in verses 19 to 28. Now with verse 19, John the Apostle is interpreting a three-day sequence of events. And we're going to cover these three days tonight, but he's interpreting a three-day sequence of events, which he does detail in these texts, and he interprets all of what happened in these three days as the testimony of of John. In other words, these events, what took place on these three days, are his witness. Now, you'll remember from last week that his witness, according to verses 6 and 8 and verse 15, he says, is not to be the light, but to bear witness to the light. And with that, in the second part of verse 19, on the first day, delegates arrive from Jerusalem. John says, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Now the Jews, this is our first introduction to the Jews in John's gospel, and we'll see them time and again. And, they, and John means different things by the word Jews, so we may have to clarify each time we get there. But first, Jews here are Jews from the Jewish Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Now, the Sanhedrin is the locus of power in Judea, but they exercised uh, power and authority beyond their jurisdiction, so clearly in the region where John is by sending these delegates. Now, the Sanhedrin is akin to the idea of a vestry in other branches of Christian denominations where you have a group of uh, superior officials that govern lower activities uh, for the people of the particular religion. So you take the idea of a vestry, but then you also take the idea of a city council. <laughs> so they're not just ruling uh, religious things, they're also ruling political things. And they've gotten word of this activity taking place near the Jordan of this Baptist proclaiming a message of repentance and that someone is coming after him. So three times they ask him in verses 20 to 28, Who are you? And he tells them exactly who he is and exactly what he's doing, that he is neither the Christ nor some awaited end-time persona. <laughs> now, I, I say end-time persona because they ask him, are you Elijah? Now, this is a figure they were awaiting to anticipate what they thought was going to be the new beginning, <laughs> when they would not just have the power they have, but have the power that they were awaiting. So that's what they mean when they say Elijah and the prophet now, then he says, I'm emphatically not them, but here we arrive to verse 23 when he says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, to, to understand this, this would be like me standing up here now saying, I am the one spoken of in 1335. 1335, 680 years. I'm the one foretold 680 years ago. Now for John to call himself that means it's not just he's this one voice out in the wilderness getting, saying getting ready for God. It means he is the person described by the prophet Isaiah who told the people of God, comfort. Comfort in something that's going to happen in 680 years. He says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is Isaiah. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
And then in verse 9 of chapter 40 of Isaiah, he says, Get up to a high mountain, O Zion, you herald of good news. O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. So what's John the Baptist out there doing? He's telling the people of God to get ready for the Son of God. And that's why he's baptizing. That's what his baptism does. His baptism prepares for what's coming. And what's coming is the glory of the Lord. Now, it's common in the Old Testament for prophets to embody and portray the Word of God. And we could list nine or ten examples of that, but we won't. Now, what we have to do is realize very powerfully what that means, what John is saying about Jesus. He's in the wilderness baptizing those that hear his message with water. And he says that there's one coming that's greater than him, and his act of baptizing signifies what this person's going to do. He's going to baptize either with the Holy Spirit, which leads to life, or with fire and judgment, which leads to death. Now, I want you to listen to me. Because what that means about Jesus, that He's going to baptize, is something very powerful and very relevant to the world in which we live and move day in and day out. It means that Jesus is not neutral. And what I mean by that is when someone comes to Jesus, as you are right now through the preaching of His Word, one of two things always happens. You are either submersed in life by faith and by receiving the message and by receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, or you are submersed in death because you reject it. Now, this is going to be a theme that we see again and again in John, but what we have to understand is that when we approach Jesus, and how do we approach Jesus? We approach Him in worship. We approach Him in His Word. We approach Him in His church. We approach Him in mission. When we approach Him, He's going to divide us. He's going to do something to our hearts. He's going to direct us either this way or this way, but staying where we are is not an option. Not if you want to follow the real Jesus. Now, you can follow a Jesus that's an idea in your head, Maybe he hangs from the dashboard of your, of your station wagon. And there are lots of... And I find that incredibly helpful because it removes the options. There's only ever two options. It's either Jesus and life... It's only ever those two. So that's his mission, to signify the coming one, that he's going to divide humanity. And the question is, which side of that division are you on? But to think that he won't divide is to not hear the truth. So that's his mission, but what about his message? And that's detailed in verses 29 to 34 with the second day's events in Bethany where Jesus just flat out, Excuse me, John just flat out points out who this Jesus is when Jesus comes to him. And he says in verse 34, I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. Now how many times have we said that? I confess Jesus to be the Son of God. But what verses 29 to 34 say, do you know what you're saying when you say that? You're saying that you confess Jesus to be the Lamb of God, verse 29, where John says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you're confessing Him to be the servant of God, the one foretold by the prophet Isaiah, that the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the God of Israel, would rest on Him. So when we say Jesus is the Son of God, when we confess Him every single week in Sunday morning worship, what we're saying is that this Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. You know, when I was, um, how old was I? I think I was in college. Uh, my best friend asked me to house sit for his parents. <laughs> Not for him, but for his parents. Big mistake. 
Um, I didn't do anything wrong. I just didn't do anything right. I just kind of showed up, slept, fed the dog. But one night as I was sleeping there, there was, this is one of the most dramatic events in my whole life. Um, there was a book on the bedside table. And I'll never forget it. It was called Faith and Future Grace. And at the time, I wasn't as much of a reader as I am now, so it was slow going for me. But I'll never forget picking up that book and being fascinated with what I found inside, of, inside it. And then coming to a sentence. I don't know when I came to this sentence, but I came to a sentence in that book sometime later that said this, God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in Him. Do you know what that means? If the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, God is most glorified in you and me when we are enjoying Him forever. Now, I've thought about that sentence for a long time, and it changed the course of my life. And I... Oh, how many years has this been? I can't do numbers. 07 to 15, eight years. So I've thought about that for a long time, and now I come to this second sentence and say, am I not most satisfied in God when I am most satisfied with Jesus? Is that not true? That if my aim is to glorify God, and if I do that by enjoying Him forever, and if you do that by enjoying Him forever, are we not most satisfied in God when we are most satisfied with Jesus? Now, what does that mean with respect to what John is saying here about Jesus, that He's the Lamb of God and He's the servant of God? It means, am I most satisfied by the fact that my sins are not on me? And your sins are not on you. Now, we all know that, but we don't live like it. <laughs> we don't love like it. We don't love or live as though Jesus has taken away our sins. But not just that, that He is the one on whom the Spirit rests, which means He's the King. Now, until we are completely satisfied with just that, that my sins are forgiven, my sins are removed, and I live under a king who rules the things I can't see. Until that happens, you're going to be bored with Christianity. It's not going to appeal to you. You're going to say, I've heard all that, I've done all that, I want to move on to the next big thing. And if that's where our hearts are, we have to step back and say, have, you, have I experienced sins being removed? and being under the reign of Jesus. But if all we ever do is reign over our own lives, we don't know anything about this joy. And until we experience it, until we ingest it, or those of you that do make a regular practice of doing this, until we drink it and eat it more and more and more to the point where it bubbles over and we just have to stand up in the wilderness and say, behold this man, we need to drink and eat more. Where am I? Okay, here's where I am. Oh, we're to his ministry. Wonderful. Now, John's ministry, verses 35 to 37. We're here at the end of our time, on the third day, when what happens here is that John fulfills his ministry. And what I mean by that is that he directs his disciples to Jesus. Look at verses 35 and 36. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. You know, when I came across this at first, I couldn't help but just think, <laughs> you know, the, the most difficult day, I think, for preachers is the day after the sermon. You know, you're, you're up, it's, it's, it's a, a majestic, powerful work of God. You pray, <laughs> feeding the sheep, and then there's the next day. Now, G John has had this powerful encounter with the Jerusalem, Jerusalem elites declaring who Jesus is in front of them. And what's he doing the next day? 
He's in the exact same spot, preaching again. He's at his post. And I couldn't bear to stop and think, this is, this is my job. Get up and preach the next message. Or for you, wake up and go to work again. Wake up and pray for the coworker who's driving you nuts. <laughs> wake up and pray for your children. Wake up, pray for your parents. Wake up and go out and have the hard conversation. That's what it is to be not just a Christian, but a Christian minister. And if we call ourselves Christians, we must call ourselves ministers because that's Jesus' command to go and be a witness for my name. And so here John is standing in his post ministering again with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and he said the same thing he said yesterday. Behold the Lamb of God. Now look what happens next. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Uh, I don't know how many in here have read Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Um, if you haven't, I'll give you my copy. You should read it. But there's an image in there. There's a character in there named Greatheart. And in the second half of the story, as he's leading Christiana uh, along this pilgrim's passage and pathway of which mirrors the Christian life, he's leading Christiana through all these difficulties and highs and lows and ups and downs and all these travails and trials. He leads her all the way to the holy city which, of course, parallels the pastor who's with you year in and year out, walking you through high and low. I've never forgotten reading that and seeing that as probably the most biblical picture of a pastor I've come by. But what I've also realized is that Greatheart, although he's the picture of a pastor in Pilgrim's Progress, he's also the picture of a mature Christian. Because there will always be younger Christians around you, Christians who need you to mature, to lead them through the difficulties of being a Christian in a non-Christian world. And you know, as we think about John's ministry and of course our ministry, I, I do think it is naive for us to think that we don't follow other Christians or that other Christians don't follow us. If we just say, oh, don't follow me, follow Jesus, that's naive. <laughs> because the fact is, other Christians do follow us. And we do follow other Christians. So the question is not whether we're following other Christians, other Christian leaders, but where are those leaders taking us? I think that's the real question. Are they taking us to Jesus as John took his disciples to Jesus? If I'm not taking you to Jesus, if Richard's not taking you to Jesus, if any pastor's not taking you to Jesus, they're not fulfilling their ministry. And by taking us to Jesus, what we mean is taking us to a real, to a personal relationship with Him. And Jesus Himself, by His Spirit, has slapped me upside the head with this fact that all knowledge is a means to love and that all knowledge is a means to Jesus. And that all the study and the work that I love to do so much is supposed to just take you by the hand and join it with this Jesus. That's my call. And your call is to do the same. It may not be with locking yourself away and like Richard and I, reading books and preparing messages. But it may be just simply preparing a meal, cleaning the kitchen. Whatever your ministry is, you need to know that it is taking people by the hand. And the question is, where is it taking them? Because to keep our disciples for ourselves is not acceptable. It's completely unacceptable. Because to do that is to be no different than any other pagan narcissist. You know, I... I I, I like public entertainment as much as the next person. Um, but it really is designed for narcissism. You recruit followers <laughs> and you keep followers. And when you lose followers, you lose your career. 
We're happy to have followers, but when we lose followers, we fulfill our career as Christians. And that's what John did. And to do that is to be a biblical leader. And that's what John holds out to us, is that, you know what, we're all in something. And the pattern we hold out and we have here from John is to commit ourselves to the mission of pointing Jesus out. And when we get to those moments where we have to deliver the message, we say it. We say, you know what? You know the reason you're having all this trouble? You bow down to the works of your hands. You bow down to this idol. Turn, repent, and follow the living God. When we get to that moment, like John, we trust God's Spirit for us to say it. But then we fulfill that ministry and we do everything in our power to get our disciples to become Jesus' disciples. And then our work is done. You know, when the police were investigating Taylor's death, um, there was a TV show that was actually following the investigation called The First 48. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that show. I watched it one time and got too scared because I just felt like I was going to be the next victim on there and everybody was going to be chronicling my death. But The First 48 uh, aired in Howard's Grove, Wisconsin. And there was a man who owned a uh, custom body shop Midwest Customs, his name happened to be Jim, too. It was Jim, Jim Harris. And he saw Jim, and he saw Taylor's car, and he saw Jim sitting in it, and he saw him washing and detailing a busted car and a bloody car, and he watched this show. And he said, in, in Howard's Grove, Wisconsin, I can fix that car, and I'm going to fix that car. I'm watching a TV show, and I can fix that car, so I'm going to fix that car. And you know what he did? He fixed it. He sacrificed hundreds of hours, thousands of his own dollars, and he restored that Continental. And at the end of the show, Jim said in tears, I've gone as far as I can to help the Bradfords heal. Now, we should stop and think about that for a second. This, this man watched a TV show, and he sacrificed all that he had to bring some kind of hope and peace and life in the midst of death. The church can go farther than a restored body of a car. We can go farther than that. We can go farther than just healing the car, but we don't. (laughs) He does and we don't. Now, I'm not talking about us individually. I'm talking about us as Christians. We have something that can bring life to the dead, that can bring pain, excuse me, that can bring comfort to the hurting, that can bring hope to the grieving. And He's inside of us. It is the Spirit of the living Jesus. It is this Jesus that John sacrificed his life for and that God waits for us to take to the next needy soul. That's what John the Baptist's life is about. Pointing people to the only place they can find life. And the call of God upon every Christian, on every church, and therefore this one too, is why will you not take me to those who need me? And that's the challenge of John the Baptist. And that's his legacy. And that's why he's still in the Holy Word, so that every time the church comes across him, they're forced to decide, will I or won't I take Jesus to those that need him most? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for John. We thank you for your holy scriptures and how they just minister deeply to our hearts. We thank you for Jim Harris and for Jim Bradford and how we pray that they have awakened us to the responsibility to take Jesus to those who don't yet have him and even to take him to ourselves afresh. 
And so, Jesus, by Your Spirit, would You move us now? Would You baptize us, figuratively speaking, into Your holy will that we might leave here changed and transformed and to know that all we have to do right now is just decide to follow You. And how we do pray it, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may sit and receive our benediction before we come together again next week. It's been a blessing fellowshipping over the Scriptures tonight and do pray that you'll come back with us next week. So receive this benediction. Now unto Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think or imagine through our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and honor and power and dominion now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.